Hello everyone, um, Simon Kaveshi and I, along with the John Clare Society Committee uh, and with the time and generosity of some Clare scholars in the UK and the US, have put together this series of video essays in celebration this year of the 200th anniversary of the publication of Clare's first volume of poetry, Poems Descriptive of Rural Life and Scenery. We were really sorry to have to cancel the John Clare Festival this July uh, due to the ongoing global pandemic we find ourselves in, um, but especially sorry because it's such a momentous anniversary year for John Clare this year. All of these uh, video essays are also going to be published in a special anniversary edition of the John Clare Society Journal, which will be winging its way to members very soon. Um, if you would like to become a member of the John Clare Society, you can find uh, information about how to do that on the John Clare Society's website. Um, Poems Descriptive of Rural Life and Scenery is in many ways a remarkable publication. Uh, extraordinary is how John Taylor described it um, in his introduction to the first edition in 1820. And these videos, uh, in their own way, really showcase um, the range of this volume as Claire is trying on lots of different voices and experimenting with lots of different poetic forms as he finds himself um, on show in the literary marketplace for the first time as a labouring class poet. Um, I hope that these essays inspire you to return to Claire's first volume yourself and to experience its variety and its ingenuity um, and to celebrate this very special anniversary with us. An excerpt from Address to a Lark. I, little larky, what's the reason, singing thus in winter season, nothing surely can be pleasing to make thee sing. For I see naught but cold and freezing, and feel it sting. Perhaps, all done with silent mourning, thou thinkest that summer is returning, and this the last cold, frosty morning to chill thy breast. If so, I pity thy discerning, and so I've guessed. Tis winter, let the cold content thee, wish after nothing till it sent thee. For disappointments will torment thee, which will be thine. I know it well, for I've had plenty misfortunes mine. Advice, sweet warbler, don't despise it. None knows what's what, but that he tries it. And then he well knows how to prize it, and so do I. Thy case, with mine I sympathize it, with many a sigh. Vain hope, of thee I've had my portion, mere flimsy cobweb, changing ocean, that flits the scene at every motion and still eggs on, with sweeter view and stronger notion to dwell upon. Now twenty years I've packed behind me, since hope's deluding tongue inclined me to fuss myself. But warbler, mind me, it's all a sham, and twenty more is as like to find me, just as I am. I'm poor enough, there's plenty knows it, obscure, how dull, my scribbling shows it. Then sure t'was madness to suppose it, what I was at, to gain preferment. There, I'll close it, so mum for that. Obviously, the address to a lark is an imitation of Burns. The second piece in the volume its placement seems designed to counter, in both tone and pace, the somewhat ponderous opener, Helpston. It's easy enough now to look at the address to a lark and think, this is fine, but it isn't the real Claire. Perhaps with the feeling that the real Claire is located closer to the middle period vein of eco-isolation. But Claire believed in his skill as an imitator and adapter, even if he was initially concerned that imitation could be viewed as plagiarism. In 1825, he sent William Hone and James Montgomery poems purported to have been written by Andrew Marvell and others. And even having confessed his own authorship to Montgomery, 
three years later, he was writing to another friend about continuing the ruse with some other compositions. I should like to have published them as old things found in imaginary books and manuscripts. There would be no harm in it, I think, would there? His pleasure in concocting accounts of these supposed discoveries, described at some length in the letters, and his focus on the craft involved in successful imitation reminds us that this activity informed his professional identity decades before the 1841 Byron impersonations that are typically viewed as paradigmatic. The dolefully amused voice of Burns, crystallized in To a Mouse, is a means for Claire to do something in Address to a Lark that he would do in different registers across the length of his career. Stand slightly outside himself, consider his own entanglements and situation from a half step of remove, and apply a little worldly wisdom to it. The wisdom proffered here follows directly from To a Mouse, though with a twist. We're destined for disappointment, not because we think of the future at all, but because we revel in the, quote, flimsy cobweb of delusive hopes. Sardonically describing his failed literary ambitions at the moment he's been, being introduced to the literary world, I'm poor enough, there's plenty knows it, obscure how dull my scribbling shows it, Claire simultaneously promises future humility and reveals a wellspring of skill. Any sense that Claire might have seen the poem as a one-off is eradicated by his late revisitation of the subject in the almost identically titled To a Lark, Singing in Winter, found in volume one of the later poems. Also in Standard Habby, this 16 stanza poem modulates away from Burnsian wryness toward a rapturous account of nature's wholeness. There is no sense here that nature's clock is broken or misunderstood. The lark has chosen a good spot to overwinter, Claire says. The god of nature guides her well. Danger still lurks, but all the lark has to do is hunker down, quote, till next year's spring comes by itself. The cautioning conclusion of the first poem wait till spring's first days are dawning to glad and cheer thee, erupts here in an ecstatic final prophecy. Then blossomed beans will bloom above thee and bumblebee buzz in and love thee. Hello, my name's Emma Mason. Um, I'm a professor of English and Comparative Literary Studies at the University of Warwick. Um, and I chose Evening um, as the celebration poem for the poem's descriptive of rural life and scenery um, extravaganza that Simon and Erin have organised. I really love this poem and wanted to read the section at the end where the fairies come in before I read my essay. While fairy visions intervene, creating dread surprise, from distant objects dimly seen that catch the doubtful eyes. And fairies now, no doubt, unseen, in silent revels sup, with dewdrop bumpers toast their queen from crowflower's golden cup. Although about these tiny things folks make so much ado, I never heed the darksome rings where they are said to go. But superstition still deceives, and fairies still prevail, while stooping genius even believes the customary tale. O loveliest time, O sweetest hours, the musing soul can find. Now evening, let thy soothing powers at freedom fill the mind. A liminal time between light and dark, labour and rest, evening grants the poet a moment of suspension in which to begin work. As Christopher Miller notes, Dusk is an occasion of perceptual adjustment in which vision yields to the oral and the imagination is vitalised. Geoffrey Hartman lyrically calls it interlunar. A site of parody and satire for Clare's predecessors, Hogarth, Fielding, his romantic contemporaries returned readers to the gentle meditations enabled by this half-lit world. Clare's evening, like Barbold and Wordsworth's, 
evokes the twilight in its grey-eyed and hazy garb, but it is also home to the hidden sensibilities and sentience of the non-human. In Claire's poem, insects and beetles buzz and clamour on the cowboy's dinner tin to remind him of their communal presence while they ease into the unhurried and sheltered realm of the gloaming. For it is in groups that the snails pace, the owls mope, the bats spin, the gnats dance and the crickets chirrup. Only the dewworms fear to leave their holes, but together brave daytime invaders anyway. This is an interconnected creation in which pools of water smooth as glass reflect every cloud to join the sky and the earth, the unseen and seen. His poem does not separate the natural and the supernatural, but registers their continuity in a shared evening space. Organic things also make way for their mystic companions here. As the breezes drop and the flowers sleep, the cowherds halloo, come moles, come moles, fades into silence and all noises become weak and faint. The narrator too, hid in cultured plain, vanishes into the bulks and fields to pursue his evening walk. Plain and cultured, labourer and poet, Claire is attuned to both the materiality of the land and the indeterminate temporality of the evening. He thus registers all things, the creaturely, the meteorological, the atmospheric, but also fairy folk and their seductive visions. While doubtful eyes might dread the mystic intervention of the fairy world into evening, Claire reminds us that their gaze remains held by the fairies' distant and dim silhouettes. Unseen, they dissipate into their silent revels to toast their queen with dewdrop bumpers and crowflower cups. Sequestered in darks and rings from which we are warned away, these sprites do not unsettle or distort the time of evening. Claire even repeats the word now to continually bring our attention back to the immediacy of his lyric and the beings described therein. The customs, rituals, magic and religions that superstition signifies might still deceive us, the narrator declares, but the story form in which they are presented perennially convinces and delights. The stooping genius believes the poem's tale because he or she welcomes phenomena that make no sense in the atomized clock time of the working day, but appear animate and vital in the hazy eve. Evening is the loveliest and sweetest of times then, because it offers the musing soul freedom and solace in a spiritual fellowship in which all things and beings are held buoyant and free. Thanks for listening. O oh, thou bliss to riches known, stranger to the poor alone, giving most where none's required, leaving none where most's desired, who, sworn friend to miser, keeps adding to his useless heaps, gifts on gifts profusely stored, till thousands swell the mouldy hoard, while poor, shattered poverty to advantage seen in me, with his rags, his wants and pain, waking pity but in vain, bowing, cringing at thy side, begs his might and is denied. Clare's an address to plenty in winter encapsulates his own situation as a, a member of the rural working class and a person whose personal circumstances are such that his family was in serious trouble. Um, there was a great deal of poverty, but in particular Claire's family were facing eviction, they were facing the poor house possibly. Um, and so when his first volume was published he had to think about how he presented himself and how he presented this personal crisis. Um, how he could encapsulate it. And it's very difficult. How do you make art out of misery? Um, and also, how do you present po rural poverty to a presumably comfortable middle-class readership in the city? 
Um, his answer really was to, to, to make this direct address to the personified figure of plenty. Um, he used the contrast between rich and poor, as we saw in that opening passage. He used the contrast between um, hoarding riches and using them, particularly for benevolence, for good works. Um, and he also used the kind of contrast between um, what is for someone like him and what could be. And so what happens is that the poem begins to develop into what was called a wish poem. That is a, a, a sort of fantasy about the comfortable life he might have with modest demands, you know, food to eat, a book to read, something to drink, a roof over his head. Um, he emphasises winter and the season of winter because that's the hardest season for the poor, both at work and at home. If you can't afford to heat, if you can't afford to shelter, if you can't afford enough food, how can you survive the cold of winter? Um, he presents it very eloquently, I think, for someone just setting out on his career. But he's also very effective in getting the message across in a particular way that suggests his own situation. He's not quite going to rub the reader's nose in it. He doesn't want to alienate his readers, but he does want to win them across. Um, and as I say, I think he does so very effectively. Um, uh, that I wouldn't particularly emphasise the passage of it. It's a six-page poem, but it's very well worth reading, I think. Because uh, he does a lot of other things in that opening volume in which he's really setting out his stall as a poet. Um, you know, he looks at the pleasures of rural life as well. Uh, he uses a lot of different forms, and including song, including sonnet. Um, but Addressed to Plenty in Winter, the second longest, I think, poem in the book, uh, after Helpston, um, really makes a very important point and does so with great eloquence. And that's why I've chosen it uh, as the poem I wanted to think about in Clare's first volume, Poems Descriptive of Rural Life and Scenery. Noon by John Clare. All how silent and how still, nothing heard but yonder mill, while the dazzled eye surveys all around a liquid blaze. And amid the scorching gleams, if we earnest look, it seems as if crooked bits of glass seemed repeatedly to pass. Oh, for a puffing breeze to blow, but breezes are all strangers now. Not a twig is seen to shake, nor the smallest bent to quake. From the river's muddy side, not a curve is seen to glide, and no longer on the stream, watching lies the silver bream, forcing from repeated springs, verges in successive rings. Bees are faint and cease to hum, birds are overpowered and dumb, rural voices all are mute, tuneless lie the pipe and flute, shepherds with their panting sheep in the swaliest corner creep, and from the tormenting heat, all are wishing to retreat. Huddled up in grass and flowers, mowers wait for cooler hours, and the cowboy seeks the sedge, ramping in the woodland hedge, while his cattle o'er the vales scamper with uplifted tails, others not so wild and mad that can better bear the gad, underneath the hedgerow lunge, or if nigh, in waters plunge. Oh, to see how the flowers are took, how it grieves me when I look. Ragged robins, once so pink, now are turned as black as ink. And the leaves being scorched so much, even crumble at the touch. Drowking lies the meadow sweet, flopping down beneath one's feet. While to all the flowers that blow, if in the open air they grow, the injurious deed alike is done by the hot, relentless sun. Even the dew is parched up from the teasel's jointed cup. Oh, poor birds, where must ye fly? Now your water pots are dry. If ye stay upon the heath, ye'll be choked and clammed to death. 
Therefore leave the shadeless goss, seek the spring head lined with moss. There your little feet may stand, safely printing on the sand, while in full possession, where purling eddies ripple clear, you with ease and plenty blessed, sip the coolest and the best. Then away and wet your throats, cheer me with your warbling notes, twill hot noon the more revive while I wander to contrive for myself a place as good in the middle of a wood, there aside some mossy bank where the grass in bunches rank, lifts its down on spindles high, shall be where I'll choose to lie, fearless of the things that creep. There I'll think and there I'll sleep, caring not to stir at all till the dew begins to fall. John Clare's poem, Noon, was written before he was 17, according to John Taylor in his introduction to poems descriptive of rural life and scenery. Although it is one of Clare's earliest poems, it nonetheless manifests several stylistic elements that are characteristic of his mature poetic voice and vision. In this brief overview, I will point out certain features that lend this poem a distinctive signature style. The first line sets the scene, all how silent and how still. The next few lines establish that it is a hot summer day with sunlight reflecting from shiny surfaces like crooked bits of glass. Everyone and everything that dwells in this landscape is seeking cool and quiet places of refuge. John Clare's distinctive voice emerges in the gentle slippage of the poem's point of view from human to animal, bird, insect, and even plant perspectives upon this situation. We learn that rural voices all are mute, and these voices include those of shepherds and cowboys, sheep and cattle, birds and bees. Local fish get into the conversation by leaping out of the river, causing ripples that spread lazily across its placid surface. Even wildflowers join this assemblage of rural voices, vividly expressing their thirst and lethargy through blackening petals, crumbling leaves, and drowking stems. Only in Clare will you find such an assured sense of dwelling among the many creatures that inhabit the rural landscape as a closely related group of family members, an interdependent biotic community. He brings this unique ecological perspective to many of his most memorable poems. And it is fascinating to see this perspective emerge so confidently in one of his earliest poems. Clare's poetic voice is distinctively regional in its diction and grammar. In this poem, by means of colorful dialect words like drowking, which means drooping, swaliest, which means shadiest, ramping, which reverts here to its old French meaning to creep or crawl. In these words, Claire enacts his own regional and class identity as candidly expressed on the book's title page, a Northamptonshire peasant. Claire's poetic idiom constitutes what I have elsewhere described as an ecolect, a term derived from the Greek word oikos, meaning house or homestead. In pastoral poesy, a poem from his unpublished collection, A Midsummer Cushion, Clare advocates a language that is evergreen, in the literal sense of a language that speaks for the earth as a dwelling place for all living things. Unlike some earlier writers, such as Robert Bloomfield, who were known as peasant poets, but whose poetic idiom quickly became assimilated to the cultural mainstream, Clare found within himself the stubborn strength needed to retain his grip on the language of his local place. His poetry consistently reflects the development of a uniquely local idiom, an ecolect that authentically emerges from his own regional dialect and is deeply inflected by his awareness of social class and local environmental conditions. The poem Noon is a first step along the journey of self-discovery that would lead John Clare where no poet had ever gone before. Despite repeated assertions in the poem's final stanza about its charms and beauties, agricultural labor is repetitive, tedious, exhausting, and painful. The workers in the harvest morning sweat, and sweat more than in any other poem that appeared in the four volumes published in Clare's lifetime. The word itself occurs four times in total, two of them in this poem. 
Thus, while there are many original stylistic features in the Harvest Morning, including the sophisticated use of Spencerian stanzas or the evocative sound imagery, Claire's attention to the physicality of work, to the felt experience of work, and to the precise movements of the worker's body renders the poem a significant experiment in depicting the lived embodiment of rural cycles and routines. Sweat has its place in literary history. It is biblical, a physiological manifestation of the human condition after the fall. In Genesis 3.19, we learn, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. So is Adam cursed, his sweat an objective correlative of original sin, visible evidence of the need for man to labor for survival. Sweat is a product of work no longer enjoyed as prelapsarian pleasure, but as arduous necessity. Sweat is anti-pastoral. It is a key feature of Stephen Duck's The Thresher's Labor, the poem that establishes the laboring class literary tradition to which Claire contributes. After a description comparing the workers' efforts to those of classical heroes, Duck's speaker asserts, quote, in briny streams our sweat descends apace, drops from our locks or trickles down our face, end quote. Duck's speaker is a part of a larger sweating collective, a peasant and a poet at once, a double subject position that despite Taylor's presentation, Claire did not inhabit as easily. Sweat signals social class. Claire knew that his peasant body was most at risk of obstructing his poetic identity in poems that described work. While he depicts bodies at work, his is not explicitly among them. A lyric I does not appear until the fifth line from the conclusion, making for the oddly disembodied quality of the description in the first several stanzas, presented without an assertion of the source of observation. In refined 18th century loco-descriptive poetry, in Thompson and in Cooper, as in Harvest Morning, only labor sweats and toils. Poets do not. To sweat is to be a peasant, not a poet. To see the loading boy's sweat, the poem speaker must be at close range, even as poetic conventions require in the imposing of artistic distance. While the speaker in the final stanza deftly likens his artistic situation to those of the gleaners, their work is not the same. Sweat is gendered. The Georgic heroism Duck had claimed for himself and his fellow mare laborers is replaced here with sentimental moralizing. The body of the female worker replaces the sweating masculine bodies as the focus of the second half of the poem. Lovely Emma does not sweat, perspire, or even glow. Her sweetly smelling breast and rosy complexion are the only signs of her response to the heat and exertion and provide a more appealing vehicle for the requisite moral generalizations about the deserving poor. Sweating, working, peasant bodies do not garner reader sympathy. Patty, ye swampy falls of pasture ground and rushy spreading greens, ye rising swells in brambles bound and freedom's wilded scenes, I've trod ye oft, and love ye dear, and kind was fate to let me. On you I found my all, for here t'was first my patty met me. Flow on, thou gently plashing streams, O weed beds wild and rank, Delighted I've enjoyed my dream upon thy mossy bank. Been moistening many a weedy stem, I've watched thee wind so clearly, and on thy bank I found the gem that makes me love thee dearly. Thou wilderness so rudely gay, oft as I seek thy plain, oft as I wend my steps away and meet my joys again, and brush the weaving branches by of briars and thorns so matty, so oft reflection warms a sigh. Here first I met my patty. Although the title suggests it is written to a woman, the recipient of this love letter is a place, 
a place of fecundity and abundance, a landscape of agriculturally controlled pasture, which is also somehow wildly free. In each stanza, a derivative of wildness appears, wielded, wild, wilderness. Patty, the poem, delights in disorder, as Robert, Robert Herrick would have put it. Yet the speaker's eye stays focused on the rudely gay natural scene and is not drawn by desire into observations of Patty's physicality, as it would with Herrick and as it tended to in Clare's later Love Lusty work. In most love poems by Clare, as in by far the majority of poems by men about women, the eponymous woman's character does not feature. Incidentally, a poem's descriptive exception is the poem My Mary, comic because she has too much character for the strictures of conventional amatory verse. Presumably, this is the same Patty that Claire would marry in 1820, who appears in Patty of the Vale, a poem also in this collection. But if we are offered anything about Patty, it remains indirect. Access to the speaker's feelings emerges via uh, extended raptures over the bounteousness of the scene, driven by his sensuous tactility. Implied analogies allow us to sketch his affection for her, but in fact what he feels remains opaque, too intimate to tell. That intrusive bemoistening, ostensibly about a riverbank, carries rich sexual overtones which course nakedly through this poem, like the plashing stream itself. Oddly, Claire's stuck with this clunky word. A shepherd's shoes suffer be moistening in a poem, Summer Morning. Lubin's eyes experience the be moistening of tears in the long poem, The Village Minstrel. And leaves are said to be be moistened by rain in the breath of morning. The poem, Patty, is a recollection of a first meeting. The loved one is not present and she is not the interlocutor. The temporal frame is nostalgic. This is a history of the beginnings of a love affair. This is a ballad of Wordsworthy and bliss of solitude, a pleasure recollected rather than a companion spoken to or touched directly. The speaker encounters his joys again. The place stimulates memories of Patty which remain hidden. The place frees the speaker to indulge and secrete pleasurable thoughts. His reflection warms a sigh. Solitary thought directed by the place prompts emotional response, but these responses will remain secret to us. Taken as it stands, there is perhaps no cause to feel sad at the isolation of this recollecting mind the poem being replete with love, delight, freedom and joy as it is. Nevertheless, Patty, the poem, is certainly of a piece with so many of Claire's love poems, which are acts of solitary monologue rather than communal dialogue, of a lover recollected and revived by versifying rather than one confidently enjoined in company. The very first poem that appears in Poems descriptive, the meeting, has the first line, here we meet, too soon to part. Now often in Claire's love poetry, separations seem to define love from the outset much more than mutually realised connections. Still, here in his recollections, our speaker might be alone, but he's not lonely. Not yet. The primrose. Welcome, pale primrose, starting up between dead matted leaves of ash and oak that strew the every lawn, the wood and spinny through, mid creeping moss and ivy's darker green. How much thy presence beautifies the ground. How sweet thy modest, unaffected pride glows on the sunny bank and wood's warm side. And where thy fairy flowers and groups are found, the schoolboy roams enchantedly along, plucking the fairest with a rude delight, while the meek shepherd stops his simple song 
to gaze a moment on the pleasing sight, or joy to see the flowers that truly bring the welcome news of sweet returning spring. Claire's delight in primroses is self-evident. A poem could hardly have a more positive and affectionate opening than welcome pale primrose. The three simple words catch the reassuring familiarity and surprise of the spring, an annual paradox shared by everyone. It's not rarity that makes the flower special, but the opposite. The primrose finds a place in the heart because of being so recognisable and reliable. The promising greeting quietly unfurls as the sonnet buds and spreads, finally opening into the full joyful affirmation of the celebratory closing couplet, where poet and readers are overjoyed to see the flowers that truly bring the welcome news of sweet returning spring. The welcome pale primrose has become the bright herald of the sweet remembered season of fresh life and renewal. Its welcome announces newness, while returning to the start of the poem, the start of last year and the start of all years in the cyclical reminder of primal creation. Claire plays on the eternal surprise by dramatising the primrose's initial appearance, starting up between dead matted leaves of ash and oak. The sudden burst of yellow amid a thick winter covering of dull dead leaves is eye-catching and unexpected, even though it happens every year. The primrose starts up, in the old sense of rising very suddenly. In doing so, it starts the poem and stirs the season into life. In Claire's day, starts also meant startles, which is just what this flower tends to do. The soft green wrinkled leaves are easy to miss until the tiny buds unfold into translucent lemon barley petals, turning a swelling vernal mound into a shimmering orb that glows on the sunny bank and wood's warm side. Primroses respond to lengthening days with their own glow, brightening south-facing banks and sunlit woodland. Oak and ash, late to come into leaf, offer bare twiggy light-filled domes for spring flowers. Traditionally and etymologically, primroses are the first or prime roses of spring, but paleness prevents their display or pride from seeming gaudy or ostentatious. The paradox of spring is matched by the paradox of modest, unaffected pride. This flower is unassuming and yet arresting, with a gentle power to beautify brown ground, enchant schoolboys and halt shepherds. No wonder it seems a fairy flower with magical influence. Not all schoolboys are inclined to pick wild flowers, and shepherds in spring are most likely to be hard at work lambing. If the meek shepherd who stops his song is also the pastoral poet, Claire may be showing that the beauty of a real primrose exceeds the flowers of poetic convention, as poesy derives from posy. But in keeping with the other natural paradoxes, this wildflower stops and starts song. The primrose starts up through dead leaves, just as Clare's poem bursts through literary tradition in response to a flower he loves. His sonnet recalls an old familiar form, stirring memories of flowers enjoyed for generations. But its sweet returning is that of the primrose, instantly recognisable and yet startlingly new. A scene. The landscape stretching view that opens wide with dribbling brooks and rivers wider floods and hills and vales and darksome lowering woods with green of varied hues and grasses pied. The low brown cottage in the sheltered nook, the steeple peeping just above the trees whose dangling leaves keep rustling in the breeze and thoughtful shepherd bending o'er his hook, and maiden stripped, haymaking too appear, and Hodge a whistling at his fallow plough, and herdsman hallooing to intruding cow. 
all these, with hundreds more, far off and near, approach my sight, and please to such excess that language fails the pleasure to express. I read this sonnet with rather guilty pleasure. Most often the delight in reading Clare's description of rural scenes and natural phenomena comes from his acute observation and poetical rendering of the detail of things and from the way he invests such descriptions with his own emotions. He introduces the reader to a scene or object with which he is intimately familiar sharing his love and often the process of discovery in a very focused way. In this sonnet, however, the landscape is generalised, the angle of vision a wide one, with all the features of rural workers that urban readers, familiar with pastoral and Georgic poetry, might expect to find. It is, as its title suggests, a pictorial representation and gives pleasure akin to that of looking at a landscape by Constable, or Clare's favourite, Peter de Wint. Clare doesn't introduce a religious element, as he does in many other poems in this volume, nor does he venture moral exhortation. He, like the reader, is here simply an observer. He doesn't identify himself with the workers, he doesn't see anything that a visit to the scene could fail to see. He even announces his failure, as he sees it, to find words to express his pleasure in what he sees. As so often, Clare refuses to confine himself to either of the standard sonnet forms, combining an Italian rhyming scheme with a Shakespearean final couplet. Furthermore, the sense of the last lines extends beyond the couplet. Summing up his observations, all these, he then adds, with hundreds more far off and near. A phrase where the lack of specificity leads to some doubt about what exactly he means. I interpret him to mean that there is so much more that he observes more than will fit into the constraints of a sonnet, and probably more than the casual viewer would see. Thus the poet is, after all, separated from the reader. He sees what they cannot. It's a common enough trope, a cliché almost, to complain that words cannot express a feeling, but these final three lines where the feeling overflows the concluding couplet, separate, but at the same time unite poet and reader, and, for me, sanction the pleasure of simple observation. To the glow worm. Tasteful illumination of the night, bright scattered twinkling star of spangled earth, Hail to the nameless coloured dark and light, the witching nurse of thy illumined birth. In thy still hour how dearly I delight to rest my weary bones from labour free. In lone spots, out of hearing, out of sight, to sigh day's smothered pains and pause on thee. Bedecking dangling briar and ivied tree, or diamonds tipping on the grassy spear, Thy pale-faced glimmering light I love to see, Gilding and glistering in the dewdrop near. O oh, still hours mate, my easing heart sobs free, While tiny bents low bend with many an added tear. Glowworms have long captivated the cultural and the poetic imagination as a figure of the extraordinary in the ordinary, of ephemeral inspiration or joy, and as a welcome guide for lovers and weary travellers. Charlotte Smith, in her poem The Glowworm, lamented how the innocent child who catches a glowworm by night, with the morning shudders to behold his lucid treasure, rayless as the dust. 
William Blake found in the glowworm a benevolent guide for the troubled, wildered and forlorn for whom it would light the ground. And William Cooper found a humbling reminder that such a reptile has its gem and boasts its splendour too. For William Wordsworth, the small, compact glow emitted by this insect was akin to the illuminating power of the sonnet itself, which he described as a glowworm lamp that cheered mild Spencer called from fairyland to struggle through dark ways. In her edition of The Natural History Prose Writings of John Clare, Margaret Granger quotes William Hazlitt's declaration in Lectures on the English Poets. Let the naturalist, if he will, catch the glowworm, carry it home with him in a box, and find it next morning nothing but a little grey worm. Let the poet, or the lover of poetry, visit it at evening, when beneath the scented hawthorn and the crescent moon it has built itself a palace of emerald light. For Clare to write his own address to the glowworm is partly for him to seek entrance to the Emerald Palace. Here he writes self-consciously as the poet, hailing the glowworm in overwrought phrases as a tasteful illumination of the night and a twinkling star of spangled earth. But there is a deeper affinity between Clare and the glowworm that surpasses these cliched apostrophes. When he wrote as a naturalist in his natural history prose, Claire voiced this familiar disenchantment that comes with seeing a glowworm up close in the daylight, finding that, he said, they was nothing then but a dead shriveled insect. But, as he continued his study, he remarked on another insect with similar luminescent properties known in his local community as, he says, a glowworm by night and the forty-legged worm by day. Here, there's a greater sensitivity to transformation and the relief that comes with it that is palpable in Clare's sonnet. Just as the cumbersome daily activity of the forty-legged worm vanishes as it takes on its evening guise as the glowworm, so too does the labourer discover at twilight an opportunity to rest weary bones from labour free and to embrace a lighter form of being. The final release of smothered pains and sobs in these lines attest to how hard won such fleeting moments of ease would be for a labouring class poet. Clare finds in the glowworm's dual nature a creaturely expression of his own poetic identity. He visits it at evening not merely as an enchanted spectator but as a familiar mate, all too aware of the return to normality that daylight will bring. The River Gouache Where winding gouache whirls round its wildest scene, on this romantic bend I sit me down. On that side view, the meadow's smoothing green, edged with the peeping hamlets checkering brown. Here, the steep bank, as dropping headlong down, while glides the stream, a silver streak between, as glide the shaded clouds along the sky, brightening and deepening, losing is their seen in light and shade to where old willows lean. Thus their broad shadow runs the river by with tree and bush replete, a wildered scene, and moss and ivy speckling on my eye. Oh, thus while musing wild, I'm doubly blessed, my woes unheeding and my heart at rest. Scholars have recognized Claire's deep engagement with aesthetic traditions, including landscape painting, the picturesque and river poetry. The river gouache invokes all these conventions only to veer away from them and thereby economically imprint Claire's distinctive perspective. His speaker chooses a romantic bend to sit me down and survey the river's wildest scene as it whirls round him. 
he never moves. But the nature of that stasis is transformed in 10 lines describing its surroundings. This change is legible in variations on a key picturesque term. Wildest scene, wildered scene, musing wild. Through the bewilderment of both the scene and the speaker, nature finally includes him and poetic consciousness becomes defined as an awareness of being absorbed into the environment, his eyes reflecting it like a river. Initially, the view, like the speaker, is relatively still, with the meadows smoothing green and town on one side and the river's steep bank as dropping headlong down on the other. But it already seems alive with adjectives made from verbs. Then it glides into motion with the river and shaded clouds, and even the rooted willows lean. The ephemerality of the clouds, brightening and deepening, losing as they're seen, communicates shimmering changeability that eventually tips into actual instability. How are we to understand the relationship between the willow's shadows and the water in the line, thus their broad shadow runs the river by? Presumably the river runs, but it seems instead as if the tree's shadow races with the shaded clouds. At the level of the river bank, the scene along with the speaker fast becomes wildered in the multiple senses of being lost, bewildered, and wild. The rhyme scheme simultaneously goes astray after a regular quatrain initially sets the scene. It is then irregular in an octave describing a wildering nature that finally encompasses the speaker in the poem's strangest line, and moss and ivy speckling on my eye. The manuscripts show that Claire considered the word sparkling, but in the end, an unsettling image won out over a more familiar twinkling eye. The line could describe, as one scholar puts it, the optical perception of the onlooker, but it more immediately suggests an eye that is no longer surveying the landscape, but instead simply reflecting its flora as passively as the silver streak of river. In the final couplet, the speaker suggests that he has merely been musing wild, but instead of dismissing this experience as fantastical, I propose taking seriously how he explores what it would mean to become unheeding with his heart at rest. Claire is keenly attuned to what the political theorist Jane Bennett calls a vibrant materiality that runs alongside and inside humans. She suggests that recognizing the extent to which all bodies are kin in the sense of inextricably enmeshed in a dense network of relations could foster a more ecological sensibility. Claire's sonnet furthers that aim by vividly imagining the possibilities of relinquishing a human consciousness that inevitably circles back around to woes in favor of a simpler awareness of possessing just the same animacy, no more, no less, as the swift current, the shape-shifting clouds, the overhanging willows, and the moss and ivy speckling in the sun.